Good evening, everyone. I'm going to try that one more time. Good evening, everyone. We are very excited to welcome you to the Clinton Center tonight. My name is Stephanie Street, and I serve as the executive director of the Clinton Foundation. And we are all just so excited that you have joined us for this global premiere of Dinosaurs Around the World. You are among the very first ever, ever to see this exhibit um, of life-size breathing and roaring dinosaurs. And I'd like to thank some of my friends and colleagues uh, before we get started who have worked tirelessly for the last several months uh, to bring this exhibit to you. First, uh, Ben Tillemeyer and uh, the communications team for the Clinton Foundation, Debbie Schock and our facilities team, Kurt Sin, Chris Mao, and all of our colleagues at the National Archives, Mike Selig, uh, Chef uh, Stephen Burrow, and the entire staff from 42 have prepared all of our wonderful treats for you this evening. And lastly, the Bruce Lindsay, the chairman of the board of the Clinton Foundation, um, who in fact had this original idea for this exhibit. Um, and Bruce is better known as Boo to his 15 grandchildren. So I think uh, Bruce is probably the most excited about uh, this exhibit. Um, our, the temporary exhibits that we do here at the Clinton Center, we try to always give our visitors uh, an opportunity to see something new and unique. And I think after you've seen this exhibit that you'll think that these uh, 13 dinosaurs are pretty uh, new and unique here. Uh, and don't forget, as you're looking at the exhibit, to visit the presidential history part of the exhibit where you can see firsthand what some of our presidents, including President Clinton, have done to preserve some of the fossil-rich areas of our country. So we really have a fantastic program tonight. Um, I'd like to get started and ask Tom Zoller of Imagine Ex Exhibitions to join me at the podium. Imagine Exhibitions has been instrumental in creating, producing, and marketing some of the world's most popular museum quality exhibitions and attractions, which have been seen by nearly 40 million people around the world. And tonight, we are premiering their next new exhibit, Tom. Hello, everybody. Thank you for coming out tonight. Uh, I, I think this could be a world's first uh, dinosaurs in a presidential library. I, I haven't checked out, but it's uh, but there are some legitimate connections. Uh, but we have we're very excited to be here. Um, this, as Stephanie said, we have many exhibitions all over the world, and this is a world first for us tonight. We uh, took the subjects of dinosaurs that we love and, uh, and, and have several exhibitions on dinosaurs around the world and wanted to take a new spin on it. Uh, so I hope you all get to learn something new tonight about dinosaurs and know that uh, the exhibit, all of our exhibitions, we hope to encourage uh, everybody, young and old, an opportunity to learn something new. Uh, and dinosaurs are a great a great subject because every day, as you'll hear more uh, from the next speaker about, um, more discoveries are made every day. There's things that we think that we knew 15 years ago that are changing today. And so we took a little bit of a different approach on this, and we talk about Pangea. Um, how many people know what Pangea means? Well, that's pretty good. So for those of you who don't, uh, the Greek root Pangea is Pan is entire, and Gia meaning Mother Earth. And the idea is that the, all the continents that we now know as the seven continents were all together as one large landmass. And so we talk about what happened, how it happened, and what type of dinosaurs have been found in those particular continents. Now, 50 years from now or tomorrow, we might find another dinosaur on a continent that we didn't know, and that's the, the evolution of, the, uh, of this story. So I hope you enjoy it. We have, uh, this is brand new tonight. You'll be the first people to see it. Um, we've spread the dinosaurs all around the museum, which is a, a good opportunity for you who haven't been here before to experiment in little different parts of the museum. So I hope you enjoy it, and the team here has been phenomenal. Uh, we've uh, been working day and night for several uh, several days or a week or so now to put this together. So I'd like to thank my team who came from Atlanta uh, and the team here at the Clinton for all the hard work. And I hope we have a great success and everyone tells all their friends and takes lots of pictures and posts them out there and gets the word out and uh, lives Bruce's dream. <laughs> All right, our special guest speaker tonight found his first dinosaur bone at the age of eight. Currently, he is a professor at Montana State University. Here are just a brief list of his accomplishments from age eight until now, and I promised I would make it very brief. I'm just like two lines, I promise, promise. 
He discovered the first dinosaur eggs in the Western Hemisphere, the first evidence of dinosaur colonial nesting, and first evidence of parental care among dinosaurs, and the first dinosaur embryos. He's also served as an advisor on all the Jurassic Park movies, and as many of you know, Dr. Horner is the real-life inspiration for the main character in the film franchise, Dr. Alan Grant. So please join me in helping me welcome Dr. Jack Horner. All right. All right. I have never in my life given a lecture in a presidential library, and I've never given a lecture to a standing audience. It's Arkansas. All right. <laughs> All right. And I have to tell you, most of you are a lot older than the audiences I usually talk to, who are mostly sitting on the floor down here. So if you have questions about dinosaurs or you know, can't pronounce the names up here, ask one of the little people. Because I assure you they know more about dinosaurs than you do. All right. Most of them ask, I ask what their favorite dinosaurs are. And a lot of times they name dinosaurs I've never heard of before. <laughs> All right. So what I want to do is I want to tell you a new thing that we're learning about dinosaurs that unfortunately isn't too popular with some of the younger people, um, especially young boys. And you'll understand why I'm saying this when we get to the end of it. All right? That is how we all expect a dinosaur to act, right? They chase people, they chase dinosaurs, and they just like to eat everything, right? That's what we expect a dinosaur to be like. We expect them to be mean and nasty and aggressive. We expect the meat-eating dinosaurs to eat everything meaty, right? And we expect the plant-eating dinosaurs to have lots of spikes and plates and horns to poke holes in the tyrannosaurs, right? That's how we think of dinosaurs. All right, well, what I've been, what I've been researching lately, I am interested in why dinosaurs have all of those accoutrements, all those extra parts. Why dinosaurs have horns and plates and spikes and domes. And the reason I'm interested in them is if you look at them, you'll notice you can't poke a hole in a tyrannosaur with all those different items. So they have to be for something different. And what I mean by that is that they have to be something that is probably similar to the animals they are closely related to. Birds. Does everyone know that dinosaurs gave rise to birds? And birds are technically live dinosaurs. All right. Now, that's hard for a lot of people to stomach. All right. Do you know that? Do you know that birds are dinosaurs? Do you believe it? Nope, he didn't believe it. All right. Well, it's, I face this all the time. Birds are living dinosaurs. And we know that just by studying their anatomy. We can study their anatomy and we learn that dinosaurs and birds have more characteristics in common than birds have with any other group of animals. So we know, it's, we know it. And besides that, we are the classifiers, so we can say whatever we want. <laughs> okay, and that's what we say. So every single bird, all birds are related to one another. All birds are related to one another. They all have a common ancestor. And all birds are living dinosaurs. Now, I want you to just think about that, because remember when we think about Tyrannosaurus as being a mean, nasty dinosaur? We don't really think of birds as being mean and nasty. We don't really think that way. So just think about, just try to 
try to bring birds into your thought about dinosaurs. All right, so what did dinosaurs do with all of these accoutrements? Their plates and their spikes and their horns, what are they for? Well, if we start with horn dinosaurs, we might be able to figure it out. Now, there's a lot of different kinds of horn dinosaurs. And of course, most people, you know, most people think that their horns are for defense, right? I mean, obviously, horn dinosaurs did poke holes in T-Rexes, right? And it only make, but it does only make sense if you think about it for a very short period of time, because if you think about it too long, you have to realize that as soon as that Triceratops actually pokes a hole in that T-Rex and kills it, where does the T where does the 12,000 pound T-Rex fall? It makes it hard for the Triceratops to get up. Is what happens. Well, what we do actually is we think about the horned dinosaurs and think about their horns. Look at the horns of these dinosaurs. Some of them point sideways. Some of them paint, point forward. Some of them, like the one Ienosaurus down in the right lower corner, are like a big giant can opener and actually curve over the front of their face. If he was trying to poke somebody with that, he would actually stick himself with those two spikes behind him. And some horned dinosaurs have no horns whatsoever. And so if dinosaurs had evolved horns to actually poke holes in other animals, all of them would have horns you could poke in another dinosaur. They wouldn't have sideways horns or tiny little short horns or no horns. So that is highly unlikely. Also, when we look at the growth of horned dinosaurs, the juveniles always have horns that curve backwards. Juvenile Triceratops horns actually curve backwards and then they grow forwards as the animal grows up. So, so that means, of course, the juveniles couldn't even defend themselves if that's what they were trying to do. So it is unlikely and therefore we don't think about that anymore. We do not, scientists do not think that horned dinosaurs actually defended themselves with their horns. So, some people recently have been thinking, even scientists have been thinking that, well, maybe they're like mammals. Maybe they have like antlers and horns. And instead of fighting and defending themselves, maybe they did like mammals and actually fought one another. Maybe they were in combat with one another. And so, as we all know, all of the animals that are in combat are males, right? They're all males fighting, and what they're doing is fighting for a female, right? So, so people have, have scientists, some scientists actually think that horned dinosaurs actually engaged in, in combat, at least the males did, for females. But unfortunately, we don't know males from females in dinosaurs. We have no way of figuring that out. And so, and we don't really actually find any evidence that they are fighting one another. And what I mean by that is, even if they did fight one another, we can see that things would not work out well for them because when we cut one of their horns, like a triceratops, it's actually hollow inside. They're very thin. The ho they're hollow inside, they're extremely thin. And the shields are also really thin. They're just millimeters thick. They're not even a quarter of an inch thick. And they have big giant holes in them. And those holes, those holes are actually, so the whole shield and the horns are all covered with keratin like our fingernail. So the hole would actually be sandwiched by, by keratin. But another dinosaur's horn could easily penetrate that keratin and then penetrate the hole. And the hole, sandwiched by keratin, is blood-filled. So as soon as you poked a hole through it, it had a blood gusher. So 
we don't think that's what happened either. All right? We do not think they actually crashed themselves together. So, but what's interesting is we have a bunch of birds that actually have bony crests on top of their heads. And so the idea, so the question is, since we have living dinosaurs that actually do have crests on top of their heads, what did they do with them? Well, it's interesting what they do with them. First off, they're very colorful. Very colorful, and that's something to think about. Because, as we know, birds are very colorful. All right, so, whoop. So, when we go back to our dinosaurs and think about them, and think about birds, and think about crests, if we, if we start looking at a variety of different kinds of dinosaurs, like this is a cassowary, has a big crest on its head. And cassowaries, actually, there's a whole bunch, there's three different kinds of cassowaries, and they live in different places. The northern cassowary lives in northern New Guinea, and the dwarf cassowary lives in the middle of New Guinea, and the southern cassowary lives in southern New Guinea. All right? They're territorial, and they can visually see who's who. And we see the same thing in hornbills. And so, we see the thing, same thing in other crested birds as well. They're all territorial. So now we think that horned dinosaurs, and in fact, different kinds of dinosaurs that look very much alike, were probably territorial. They actually could probably spot one another and just stay out of each other's way. We have recently also found some evidence that some of the dinosaurs that do not look like they have accoutrements, plates or spikes or things like that. Just last year, we found a fossil with a soft, with the impression of a soft tissue crest on it. And so, we know now that some dinosaurs actually had combs like chickens. <laughs> soft tissue combs like chickens. What do chickens do with their combs? Well, it turns out that they actually evaluate one another. That is one of the ways that males and females evaluate each other. And if the comb is pretty, then you can get chosen. If it's not pretty, you get rejected. So it's good you have a good comb. So dinosaurs may have done the same thing. They may have evaluated one another to see who was cool. So really, what we're discovering is that there's, that the crests of birds and the crests of dinosaurs were probably used for things like, like attracting mates and repelling rivals. And so that is at least some of the things that these dinosaurs probably did with all their accoutrements. But that's not all, because when we look around, there's incredible accoutrements, incredible ones, and they're almost all covered with keratin, like your fingernail which is also like the beak of birds. And when we start looking at the variety of different accoutrements that we see in all of the birds, whether they're hard crests or whether they're soft tissues or whether they're feathers even, what we see is a wide variety. And one of the things we know about birds is that they use these for display. And display is something that is very important and it's actually even more important than defending yourself. You can always run away. But displaying is very, very important. That is the ability to get a mate. And so we know that birds, with all of their accoutrements, use their accoutrements to make these lavish displays. And one of the things that so one of the things we think is that even stegosaurs and, and triceratops and all these kinds of dinosaurs probably did displays. Now think about displays in birds, right? So even the big giant sauropods we think could stand up on their hind legs and display to one another, and they would have been really beautiful. Horned dinosaurs like triceratops would have also been very beautiful, and in fact, when you see the dinosaurs from around the world, they are very colorful. 
but I think they're not colorful enough. I think horned dinosaurs were extraordinarily brightly colored, just like the living dinosaurs are also brightly colored. I don't want to see any more dinosaurs that are gray and brown and black and ugly. I want to see brightly colored dinosaurs. So, what do they do with them? They dance. Birds dance. That's how they display. So the next time you think about dinosaurs, think about birds. Birds dance. Dinosaurs danced. <laughs> how is that for different? All right, so the next time you think about dinosaurs, think about dinosaurs actually standing up, dancing with one another. Not being mean and nasty and brown. <laughs> now, I have to just tell you that, that this does not go over well with Steven Spielberg. I have had a number of arguments with him. I told him I really wanted the dinosaurs to be really colorful in the movie, and he said, Technicolor dinosaurs do not sell. I think they would. But I wanted the dinosaurs feathered and colorful, and he made them brown without feathers. So brown without feathers are mean dinosaurs, colorful dinosaurs with feathers, dance, but they don't star in movies. Thank you very much. Thank you. You're welcome. Well, thank you. I think we'll all definitely think of dinosaurs in a different way when we all go through and look at the exhibit. Um, Dr. Horner, thank you again so much. I hope you'll uh, come back during the life of this exhibit and do some other programs for us. Um, I, I hope you all will enjoy the world premiere of this extraordinary exhibit. Um, we have wonderful refreshments uh, right outside the doors here, down in the lobby. The galleries are open for viewing now, so please enjoy the rest of your evening, and thank you for coming.